Parsha this week is one of the shortest in the Torah. It spans only 67 verses from Vayikra 12, 1 through 13, 59. It's named Zariah. And it means to conceive or to bear a child, which is a fit title for this week's Parsha, is it not? Because it is a reference to one of the most miraculous events of all, the birth of a child. Chapter 12 has only eight verses, but these verses establish Yehovah's commandments regarding the responsibilities of the husband and the wife after the birth of a child. The responsibilities are different, however, if it's a male child, a boy, or a girl. Now, these, are comp these commandments are not complicated, and if the child is a son, then the mother, okay, is unclean for seven days, as in the days of her monthly separation, the Nida. She remains in the blood of her cleansing for another 33 days, for 40 days altogether. She does not touch whatever is set apart, nor does she come into the set apart place until the days of her cleansing are completed. And on the eighth day, their son is circumcised. Now, if the child is a daughter, the requirements are double. The mother is unclean for two weeks, and she remains in the blood of her cleansing for 66 days for a total of 80 days. Now, after the time of her cleansing, the offerings she is to bring are the same whether the child was a boy or a girl. Okay? Simple, straightforward commandments. Chapter 13 is much longer containing 59 of the 67 verses of the Parsha. And this chapter calls, uh, covers the laws of determining whether or not a person has been afflicted with the unique malady called Za'arat, which, thanks to the Greek translation of the Tanakh, has been mistranslated as leprosy. It is not the leprosy. It's known as Hansen disease of the day. Za'arat is not a contagious disease, at least not physically. It means to erupt. In fact, it's referred to as an eruption several times throughout chapter 13. Now, it can manifest itself in several different ways. It can be a swelling on the skin that has turned the hair within the swelling white and can eventually cover the entire body. It can be a boil, a burn, an infection on the head, a man losing his hair so that he's bald on his forehead with presentations there. Strangely enough, the right can appear on the, someone's garment, a garment of wool or, or linen, and on any leather object. You get the idea that there's a special purpose for it, Zara, right, right? Now, at first glance, one has to wonder why these two subjects are combined or together in one portion. Childbirth is not associated with sin. While it appears that Zaharat, well, for now, let me say maybe, probably is, usually the contents of a Parsha share something in common. And together they tell a complete story or at least present a very important lesson for us as his people. So under, to understand the uh, tie that binds between these two subjects, childbirth and Zaharat, what they have in common, uh, we must look at a very simple level first, okay? What we know is the Peshat. And on a very simple level, what is it? Okay, this, come on, y'all. This, no, this is not a lecture. This is our study together. What's, what, right off the bat, what's one thing you see that ties a lot together with childbirth? It renders the person unclean, okay? So, uh, what does unclean mean? From time A, it means to be contaminated or to lose your purity. And both a woman giving birth in the Zorot, which is known as a Mazora, okay, are unclean. But they're unclean for different reasons. And this is, this is something that, uh, unfortunately, many people fail to recognize. They're unclean, but for very, very different reasons. The mother is unclean for a certain period of time, depending on 
with the with the boy or girl while the body cleanses itself. Now, perhaps a better word to use than cleanse would be purifies itself. Okay, the word translated as cleanse or cleansing in this in chapter twelve is tohora, and tohora means just that to purify or to be free from foreign elements. And after the birth of a child, a woman's body goes through a time of purification, releasing some of the things that were associated with childbirth. Now, during this time, she is not allowed to touch whatever is set apart, and she does not come into the set-apart place until the days of her cleansing are complete. Having said that, though, we recognize a question or two here. What are, what are the set-apart items, and which set-apart place are we referring to? Now, during the years in which we had the tabernacle and the temple, no one but the Aaronic priesthood was allowed into the set-apart place, right? So evidently, that's not the set-apart place that these commandments refer to. So we have to determine what is that set-apart place. Now, most would agree that during the time of the tabernacle, it included the courtyard that was encircled around the tabernacle. She was not allowed to come into there. And during the time of the temple era, uh, it referred to the court of the women that was on the temple mount, that during this time after childbirth, she would not be allowed to enter. Now, others, depending on their background and what schools they studied under, their interpretation of these commandments, go much further and include any synagogue where there is a Torah scroll, menorahs, and so forth. The point is, the woman who has given birth is restricted from touching set-apart items or from entering certain places. Now, which places this may refer to, surprisingly, given who we are, is up to a little bit of debate. Actually, there's volumes written about this whole one issue. The point is, it's not to be taken lightly. It was important enough for the Father to include this in his scripture, so it's not something that we just brush off and forget about. But let's go now to the regards of the one inflicted, afflicted with Zaharat. Now, a person who the coin suspects has been afflicted, but he cannot make a confident diagnosis of it being Zaharat, we are told he is shut up for seven-day intervals until that affliction either manifests itself where the Kohen can say definitely it's all right or that he is clean. Now, that word shut up or isolated is from the root word that the psalmic, the pay, and the resh, and it means to be confined or imprisoned if the affliction spreads, if the physical signs are there. The Kohen declares him unclean, and guess what word unclean is from? Tohor, the same word, same root word is for the woman who is unclean in childbirth. So they are both unclean. While the woman is not shut up or confined, the suspected mitzor is. Now there's a couple of major differences here. One of them is pretty obvious. It doesn't take a koan to determine if a woman is giving birth to a child. Right? Mm -hmm. And she didn't sin. Although they does a call require sin offering after afterwards for different reasons. But it doesn't take anybody particularly trained in any idea or any knowledge to tell when a woman's given birth to a child. Okay. It also tells us uh, that while it does take a Cohen to diagnose or to identify as all right. Since we don't have a practicing priesthood, it would be impossible for us to determine a person having Zaharat or to declare him a Metzor today. Now, even though both childbirth and Zaharat are manifested by physical signs, what is it about it that makes a person unclean? And for that answer, we go to a beyond the physical to a much deeper look. Now, as I mentioned, why do you think I'm going to spend time on this subject today? 
what is it that's important enough about a woman giving birth and a, and a person afflicted as our art that we would devote a Shabbat Midrash to? It's in his word, and we follow the Torah portions every week. But I also think that most people greatly misunderstand the difference between unclean, between a woman that's given birth and a person that's afflicted as our right. As I mentioned earlier, the, a woman's body goes through a period in which it purifies itself. And without going into too much detail, okay, certain elements associated with conception and birth begin to die after the child is born, and these are purged from the body. Now, for a lack of a better word, these dying elements render this woman, Tame, unclean. Now, one traditional thought given as the explanation of why Yehovah established this time of uncleanness for a woman is to what? What do you think? Huh? Purify? Well, okay. The body's going to purify itself, period, anyway, right? It's the way he created the, the female body to do. What's the spiritual reason behind it? What lesson does it teach to men and women? Okay? I'm going to give you my thoughts on this, okay? And, and feel free to add your thoughts later. If they're way different than mine, feel free to give your thoughts sometime next week, okay? One reason for this uncleanness for the woman is to remind us that Elohim, he is the Elohim of the living, not the dead. Of course, the woman is not dead, okay? But consider these passages from Devarim 14.1. You are the children of Jehovah your Elohim. Do not cut yourselves nor shave the front of your head for the dead. Because he's not the Elohim of the dead. He will deal with the dead later. Matthew 22, 32. I am the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yitzchak, the Elohim of Yaakov. Elohim is not the Elohim of the dead, but of the living. What happens if the dead comes into the presence of Elohim? Acts 26, eight, 26, verse 8. Why is it considered unbelievable among you if Elohim raises the dead? He is not the Elohim of the dead because the dead know nothing. The living know him. Death is a separation from our father. Unfortunately, people don't recognize that there's two forms of death. One is a physical separation. The other is a spiritual separation from our Father. And only the living can remain in his presence. So when we see a woman that has given birth, and I'm going to repeat this, one of the most miraculous events a person can ever witness. And if you've ever been in on a delivery of a child, it is is beyond description, okay? What we should recognize and what we must know is that she is not unclean because of sin. She's unclean because of a blessing. Probably the greatest blessing there can be. She has been a part of bringing a life into this world. Now, traditional teaching is that there are three parties involved in the conception and birth of a child. The mother, of course, the father, of course, and Jehovah Elohim. All three have a part in bringing a child into this world. And this should remind us that it's our Elohim who gives us life. And he is the Elohim of the living, not the dead. For us today, it's very symbolic of the fact that we are alive today through his son and we have been born again into his kingdom. As Saul wrote, so you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Paul must not have realized that 
we're just sinners saved by grace that we'll never master sin. Poor man. Let's all realize the truth. We are to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed to sin. But alive to Elohim and Messiah, Yehoshua, our master. And the birth of a child should be a time when we all pause and remind ourselves that we were all once dead to sin ourselves, and unless we had been reborn, we would have remained in that state. So a woman who is unclean after giving birth is to be honored and respected, not looked upon as she's done something wrong because she's temporarily unclean. The same is true for a woman during the time of her monthly separation. Both are symbolic of times of purification and restoration, a purification and restoration that we all needed in order to walk in our Father's presence. Well, what about a person afflicted with Zaharat? Theirs is a different story altogether. Interestingly enough, Torah doesn't state clearly what causes a person to become afflicted with this strange disease. And yet, the Torah de devotes an in 59 verses to this one ailment. That's a lot of verses for one thing in this Torah. And when we see this many verses devoted to one subject, what should that tell us? Of course, when he says do not sin, that's important too, and that's only three words. But when he devotes this much time, it's something that in our daily lives we need to be very aware of. Because usually, unlike childbirth, we don't see it coming. And all of a sudden, okay, so it's something that we need to be aware of. And so since we're not told what the exact cause is, how in the world can we be aware of it? Because everything got to be confirmed by two or three witnesses, right? Uh, this, this idea of Zaharat, it is considered by many rabbinic authorities to be as much of a sin as idolatry, murder, and incest combined. That's how much emphasis rabbinic authorities put on it. And while I'm not too concerned with rabbinic authorities, I am very concerned with the Father's authority, what he has to say about it. And so when we want to find out what the possible cause or causes of are, we need to go back to Scripture. And the first place we're going to go look is in the book of Bamidbar, book of Numbers, chapter 12. This is one passage that gives us a clue. In the first two verses of chapter 12 of Bamidbar, we are told, and I'll give you a minute to get there, okay? We are told, now Miriam and Aharon spoke against Moshe, because of the Cushite woman whom he had taken, for he had taken a Cushite woman, and they said, has Jehovah spoken only through Moshe? Has he not spoken to us? And Jehovah heard it. Uh-oh. Heard it. How many things were they speaking against Moshe in those two verses? How many? What's the two things that they had against Moshe in this, in this passage? One is, he married a Cushite. How dare him? The second one is, what? People think Jehovah only speaks to him. Hadn't he spoken to us too? Think they were a little jealous of his relationship? Do I, I'm sorry. Yeah. So there's actually a couple things here that Cause Jehovah to put his attention. But what else does it tell us? Jehovah heard it. Jehovah hears what comes out of our mouth. Oops. Has anybody in here ever said something that they wish they had not have said? And how much more 
you wish you hadn't said it when you know that Jehovah heard it. It's like, whoop, can I get those words back? Nope, they're gone. And hearing their conversation, he called Moshe, Aharon, and Miriam to the tent of appointments. I think they were wondering what this was about. When they arrived, Jehovah came down in a column of cloud and stood at the door of the tent. And he called Aharon and Miriam forward. Those of you that may have gotten in trouble in high school, and I'm going on word of mouth, you, knew, you, you probably can understand this if you were ever called to the principal's office. You know this was not going to be good, right? Or so they tell me. And in his conversation with the two, the brother and sister, he explained to them that Moshe was his chosen prophet who had seen the form of Jehovah. Uh-oh. <clears throat> well, we'll talk about that later. It was his chosen Navi who had seen the form of Jehovah. As such, why were they not afraid to speak against his chosen servant Moshe? And we're told in the verses, I think it's verse 8, Jehovah's displeasure burned against Aharon and Miriam, and he left them, but when he did... Miriam was Zorahat, afflicted with Zorahat. Matter of fact, she was as white as snow. But only Miriam, not Aharon. Yeah, anybody ever wonder why that was so unfair? I noticed it was for the Miriam's classification there. We would have brought that point up too. He got away with the golden calf, too. <laughs> hmm. I think the answer may be found in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 12. It was Aharon who asked Moshe to forgive them for their sins, stating they had acted foolishly in what they had sinned. Miriam didn't. Oh, but it was after the fact. Well, I hate to tell you this, but Jehovah knows the end from the beginning. And Miriam didn't ask for forgiveness, at least not that we're recorded here. So that may be one possible reason why Miriam was afflicted and Aharon wasn't. Maybe not, but it's there in Scripture to read. But when they saw that Miriam was afflicted, he cried out to Moshe, and Moshe called out to Jehovah and asked him to heal his sister. And Jehovah did but only after Miriam was shut out of the camp for seven days. But also, if you'll notice in that passage, you see the love and respect that the people of Israel had for Miriam because they didn't pick up and move until she was allowed back into the camp. Okay. Later on, Moshe recognized the seriousness of slander and gossip and he reinforced this teaching to the generation that was camped on the plains of Moab and were preparing to cross over to Israel. In Deuteronomy, Devarim chapter 24, verses 8 and 9, okay? He told that generation, Take heed, in an outbreak of Zaharat, an outbreak, or when you think of the word outbreak, what, is, what does it come to mind? One person having it? Or an outbreak a lot of people having it? So he said, take heed in an outbreak of Zorah to diligently guard and do according to all the Kohanim the Levites teach you. As I have commanded them, so you shall guard to do. Remember what Jehovah your Elohim, did to Miriam on the way when you came out of Mitzurim. So you get the idea that Zaharat was something that was given to make a person or even people aware of what we know as Lashon Hara, the evil tongue or evil speech, slander. What, 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 what all could go into that? Slander. Y'all don't want to talk about this, do you? <laughs> slander, gossip, backbiting. What else? 
Hmm? Bang false witness, rumor mill. Remember the old party lines you could listen in on, find out who was doing what, you know? It's all got to do with what? Hmm? The evil tongue, but the evil tongue is a reflection of what? The heart. Hmm. Wow. Strangely enough, Moshe himself may have once been afflicted with Zaharah. Remember when? Although it was not to the degree, exactly. Not to the degree his sister was, but remember when he encountered Jehovah in the wilderness at the burning bush? He told Moshe he was sending him in to deliver his people. Okay? And it appears that Moshe was unsure about this assignment he was being given. And he responded, and if they don't believe me nor listen to my voice and they say, Jehovah has not appeared to you, well, how am I going to convince them? And in response, Jehovah had given Moshe three signs in order to convince the Israelites, the leadership, that he had indeed sent them in. And the second sign was for Moshe to put his hand in his bosom and when he took it out, his hand was the orat ha shaleg, Mitzora white as snow. Just his hand. And some teachers, Hebrew teachers, see this as much a sign of a punishment for Moshe because he doubted that the leaders of Israel would believe that Yehovah had sent him. He, he cast dispersions on the integrity of the leadership of Israel that he was sent to. And so... He was given this sign to convince him. Doesn't really sound like a bad question to ask, though. What do they do if they don't believe me? Which, to me, reinforces how easy it is to speak evil of someone or to put doubt on them, about them, not on them. Now, the importance Jehovah places on our not speaking ill of anyone is found in the Amidah prayer in the Siddur. And in the Amidah prayer, it states, O Elohim, guard my tongue from evil and my lips from speaking deceitfully. To those who curse me, let my soul be silent and let my soul be like dust to everyone. So we recognize the dangers. But the concept of letting one's soul be silent when people are cursing you and to be like dust is based on a teaching that we should ignore the barbs and insults of others because the less a person cares about his own prestige, the less he will let selflessness, selfishness, interfere with his service to Jehovah and his efforts to improve himself. Basically, when you're more focused on serving Jehovah and being like him, you tend to let what people say about you go without getting in their face. You pray for them. Messiah said a really good example of that for us because every people said a lot of bad things about him and took it a step further and nailed him to a tree outside of Jerusalem. And what did he say? Forgive them, Father. They don't really understand what they're doing. Now, that same teaching is found in Tehillim chapter 15. Yehovah, who does sojourn in your tent? Who does dwell in your set-apart mountain? He who walks blamelessly and does righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart, he has not slandered with his tongue and he has not done evil to his neighbor, nor lifted up reproach against his friend. These are just a few examples, but there are many, many, many more throughout Scripture about the dangers of speaking evil against a brother. 
Now, Yaakov wrote that no man is able to tame his tongue. With it, we bless our father and curse men who have been made in the likeness of Elohim. This should not be so. That was Yaakov chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Now, his words merely reflected the teachings of his half-brother, Messiah Yeshua, who taught that we will have to give an account of every idle word we speak on the day of judgment. He said, for by your word you shall be declared righteous, and by your word you shall be declared unrighteous. Now, I want you to stop a minute and think about things you may have said about people in the past. And now I want you to think about the day you're going to stand before the Messiah. Are your words going to convict you or exalt you? Okay, you had enough time to think? Thank goodness for the blood of Messiah. That we can put some things behind us and have them washed clean as snow and erased. Huh. A woman who is unclean after giving birth is a sign of hope, restoration, and life for us all. She is a reminder of our own rebirth from the impurities of sin and death and of our new life of walking in the footsteps of the Messiah. The uncleanness of Zarat is far different, far more sinister. The uncleanness of childbirth is a reminder of Jehovah's love for us. And the stain of Zarat is a reminder of one's failure to love his neighbor as himself. This Sabbath and in the days ahead, let me challenge you just as I have challenged myself. Stop and think about what you have said about people in the past. Past. Not just what you said, but maybe in the questions you might have asked about them that might have placed doubts about their character in the minds of others. You know, you can actually ask an innocent question and do a whole lot of damage. And actually, your question is not as innocent as you thought it was. Have we been guilty? of the Zahra, even when it wasn't intentional? So how do we stop it? How do you stop the Zahra? Y'all have all given me the answer hundreds of times throughout the Sabbath and the meetings and teachings we've had. Every one of you have given me this answer. Let's go with something that's possible for some. <laughs> live, live Torah. Live a Torah observant life. Torah forbids us to demean the character of any of us. It challenges us. It commands us to absorb the hurt and the barbs and the remarks of others and forgive them and ask the Father to forgive them. Oh, that doesn't say that in Torah, does it? It came from the mouth of the living Torah who taught us if you don't forgive, the Father won't forgive. Who taught us to love our neighbors ourselves. So if we really want to do away with Lashon Hara, this evil tongue, the slander, all we got to do is live Torah. But if you're gossiping or backbiting or spreading rumors or asking questions that may impinge upon a person's character, put doubt in other people's minds, you are not following Torah. It's just as simple as that. Now I got another question for you. I wonder... What would the body of Messiah look like if Zarat still manifests in our bodies, garments, and leather objects? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Look, this is 59 verses in Torah. It's not something that you just kind of just pass. Oh, that was 2,000, 3,000 years ago. No, this is today. 
It's alive and well today. What would it look like if it still manifests itself on our bodies or our garments? And the next question would be, what testimony would this give to the nations around us? How many people, how tempted would a Gentile be to graft into Israel if they could see the results of Lashon Hara? If we were all walking around with white scaly stuff and boils and blisters. and Oh yeah, I want to be part of them. Now one of the hardest questions, it is a is it a blessing that we are no longer afflicted with Zaharat? Or would we be better off if we were? What do you think? It would help put a stop. Well, why did they stop it? How come we don't still have it? You'd think after all these generations, we'd grow up and learn to quit speaking about each other speaking bad about each other. That we would be exalting and encouraging and uplifting when we talk to a brother or about a brother. Seems he had more confidence in ourselves than we did. That we would finally grow up and do what it's about. To be a part of Israel is to be called to a higher standard of living than the nations around us. Not only to a higher standard, but a much different standard. Our standard of living is Torah, which teaches us to live as our Messiah lives and to be set apart as our Father in heaven is set apart. We can talk about being Torah observant till the Messiah returns, but are we living it? Are we comparing ourselves to the Messiah? Are we watching what comes out of our mouth? Are we truly being Torah observant? Can a person be Torah observant if they're casting doubt on a brother's character or saying things about him? No. Our call to the life that the Messiah calls us to live is higher, more demanding than the standards of the nations that are around us. But at the same time, he carries far greater rewards than what await the nations of this world. The closer you draw to him, the more you walk in the footsteps of the Messiah, and the more you guard your tongue, the better your rewards are going to be in the world to come. So it boils down to this. What are you willing to invest in this world for the rewards in the world to come? including not talking about somebody except to lift them up, exalt them. You know, it's amazing to me growing up, I was taught, well, if you can't say something good about somebody, don't say anything. I wonder where they got that idea. Good advice, even if they're not sure where it came from. I, most of the people that told me that didn't know what Lashon Hara meant. Well, they did. They just didn't know how to put it in the Hebrew word. Okay? And with that, I'm going to say Shabbat Shalom.